Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you all with us. And this is another episode of Rise of the Right. Today, this episode is dedicated to Pride Month and the struggles of LGBTQ people in our country and across the globe. The right wing in America has been fighting against and demonizing gay, lesbian, and trans people even before they obtain power, the right that is, even before the dawn of this movement. And now they're changing laws and fighting against the deeply embedded culture we've been fighting for in this country. The likes of the moral majority and Jerry Falwell and right-wing strategists like Richard Vigory back in the day in the 70s and 80s created this movement, and now it's actually seizing power in at least 26 states in this country. And one of their first moves, along with diminishing voting rights, has been an assault on LGBTQ rights and its community. So in this conversation, we look back at our history, the rights that our struggles have gained, and look at the battles we face today in another cross-generational conversation that's critical for our future. We're joined by Alan Young, who I've known for a long time, though I have not seen him in a while. He's a journalist and author. I met him when he was a reporter at the Washington Post, and he quit there. That's another story. He's a member of the Liber- he was a member of the Liberation News Service back in Washington, D.C. in the late 60s, was part of the Vence Ramos Brigades, where he spoke out against the treatment of gays inside the Cuban Revolution, became part of the Gay Liberation Front after the Stonewall Rebellions, and has continued his activism to this day. And Lexley McMenamin, who is the news and politics editor at Teen Vogue. They are also a freelance writer covering politics, identity, activist movements, and pop culture. And they've been published in the BBC, Them, ID, and many other places. And Kalima Young, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Electronic Media and Film, where she teaches the principles of film and media production. She's also an activist. She's part of a, a force which is upsetting rape culture's world in our country. They're building the Monument Quilt Project and part of Rooted, a black LGBTQ healing collective. And again, I will say both for Kalima and Alan, I've known them both a long time, and I'm just meeting Lexi, and good to have all three of you with us. Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having us. Yeah, that's great. So, so I, I actually want to start this conversation kind of, kind of looking at the arc of history and, and where we find ourselves now. You know, I keep thinking to myself, both in, in this world of, of gay, lesbian, trans rights in our country, uh, and the battle around that, and all the other battles we fought for that stem from the 30s through the early 70s, and this huge pushback that's taking place now. And how, where do you all find yourselves in, at this moment in terms of, in, in that perspective? Because it, it feels like we're back, which I think is, if you look at history, it's not unusual, but we're, we're, we seem to be back in the trenches fighting for everything that we fought for once before that we thought we'd gotten to a certain place in. And Alan, since you are, along with me in this group, the elder, let me start with you. <laughs> well, one thing I'll say about being back is I'm not back in the closet and I'm not going back in the closet. <laughs> um, I remember the closet. I remember it very well. It was a time of horrible repression. When I was a teenager and even into my 20s, um, the medical and psychiatric establishment said that I was mentally ill because I was a gay man. There were so many laws against us. It would take me an hour to even list the laws, but I'll just tell you one, just to give you an example of how crazy it was. It was illegal to serve an alcoholic drink to a homosexual in the city of New York when I was a college student. That's just one example of the laws. The the sexual acts that we practiced were illegal and uh, some of those acts were even if Ill- illegal if you were a heterosexual and we fought very hard we fought the psychiatric establishment we fought in the legislatures and in the courts and we had many victories and the most important victory i think is revealed in the slogan that we had in the gay liberation front which was out of the closets into the streets And we went into the streets to demonstrate. And that was one of the ways that we brought about change. And we brought about change inside ourselves. And that's where the word pride comes from. What's the opposite of pride? Because this is Pride Month. It's shame. We were supposed to be ashamed of who we were. And when we overcame that shame, it was a huge victory. And I still celebrate that victory every day, along along with many friends, gay and straight gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, we look for freedom and individual rights, and we continue to strive for those things. Kalima? Um, thank you very much for that 
historical perspective, Alan. Um, so I guess I feel like um, really coming into my identity in the 1990s and early 2000s, you know, um, I feel like this, there was never not a struggle and there has never not been time where we've been fighting and pushing and continuing to move the needle forward. One of the things I like to think about as, um, you know, you have, uh, is, is how the theorizing that was very grassroots went into the academy and then filtered back out into these activist spaces. And I feel like I came of age and to my identity in the midst of that, where things that had bubbled up from the grassroots space had come into the academy and started giving me more language and ways to understand my identity as a black lesbian woman and to understand power and to understand relationships and as it relates to power. And I feel like because of that sort of politicizing that 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 element of uh, politics and academia, um, there's never been a time where I've not been, and that the other folks that are within my cohort in the queer universe um, have not been in a space where we've been fighting and creating new language and creating new frameworks born out of like grassroots understandings of things. So now that we have this sort of political pushback that's happening, I am remiss to think that it's a new pushback because every single time that you're pushing for something, you're always going to have folks that are pushing against it. Like we, um, friction is a productive space. I guess that's my way of thinking that's, about it. I like it, that. Right? That's interesting. Friction is a right. productive space. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One stick alone is just a stick. Two sticks, you rub them together, it creates heat and it creates light. So in our most frictive moments, we come up with the most expansive ways to understand what we've got to do next. So I'm just ready to keep on expanding and fighting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. Lexi. Yeah, this is so fun. What a linear little conversation we're going to have. Thank you, <laughs> Alan and Kalima for sharing what you've shared so far. Um, I started attending undergrad in the mid 2010s. So I graduated about a decade ago now or not graduated. I started college like a decade ago, which um, feels like forever um, to me at this moment. But I know that seems silly. Um, and I was really fortunate to be um, coming into higher ed at the same time as the Ferguson protests and honestly like the movement for black lives really was my first organizing space and radicalizing space but at the same time there were already other trans folks and queer folks who couldn't use the bathrooms at our college and so like a lot of the organizing that I was doing ended up just being the same folks you know like the same groups then beginning to work for gender inclusive bathrooms on our campus and this was maybe 2014 2015 and now you know we're hearing a lot of the same conversations. I Similarly, I feel like I'm repeating myself, even though it wasn't that long ago. Um, and as a political reporter and editor, I think that there's certainly been a media push to make it seem like this backlash came out of nowhere. And like, these are crisis moments that have just suddenly emerged. And these tactics were just brand new. Um, and I think sort of to what Alan and Kalima just said, like, it's actually just part of like a trajectory. Like, these are just the same tactics that right wing actors have pushed over and over again, that they've had varying levels of success to continue using because ultimately they're not that creative in the same, like Kalima was saying about friction as a generative space. They don't have that friction. They're used to operating from the position of power that makes it possible for them to create bathrooms that you don't feel safe going into or, you know, the backlash that makes it necessary to have something like the movement for back black lives to have even come up in the last, you know, 15 years or whatever. And so, um, yeah, I think in this mo moment, I've been feeling really grateful to have been raised up by uh, specifically a lot of like black women organizers who I, I didn't feel like shocked when all of this started happening in the last kind of five years, because it just feels like um, the backlash has shifted, right? Like, so that the boot just keeps coming down harder and harder. But if you were or already paying attention to the boot, then you wouldn't have necessarily been that surprised that it's crushing, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so that, I guess, is kind of what, I, I guess, grateful to people of Kalima's generation and Alan's generation of 
welcomed me into this movement in the last 10 years and to be covering it because um, if you're looking at the history, there's not that many surprises. It's just that it sucks. But at the same time, throughout the history, we've always been there being smarter and better and more committed and more dogged to respond. Yes. I'd like to add something to, to what you now. just said. Let's see. Um, you know, the word intersectionality has come up uh, in recent years um, in, in your generation. We didn't use that word, but we knew what intersectionality was at the New York Gay Liberation Front. We were demonstrating and actually even donating money to the Black Panther Party when they were being persecuted by police in New York City uh, and elsewhere, New Haven, uh, Connecticut. Uh, one of uh, the members of the New York Gay Liberation Front spoke at a rally for the Panthers in New Haven, and he called upon the audience to stop using uh, pejorative terms like faggot and to make changes within the left. And we made enormous changes. And UEP Newton of the Black Panther Party came out with a strong statement in support of gay rights. And these memories are very important uh, because we, uh, and some of us had participated in various aspects of the civil rights movement. I went to Washington DC when Martin Luther King gave his famous, I have a dream speech. And people, I demonstrated as a college student when the Woolworth Company in New York, in solidarity with with uh, black people in the South that were uh, combating against uh, segregation at lunch counters, and and we we made these alliances with other people, and that was very important to us. And but on the other hand, we have to be very careful not to distort history, and uh, I think it's important to be accurate. For example, and I may be getting myself into trouble here. Some people have said that the Stonewall Rebellion was started by transgender people of color. Frankly, that's not really true. There were a small number of women and transvestites, as they call themselves, that went to the Stonewall. But the Stonewall was primarily a gay bar for in, uh, that white gay men to. So uh, white gay men really were the, the main actors at Stonewall. There were other people there. But um, we have to be careful to maintain the facts. Yes. And um, th that's important to me. Can I hop in real quick just from what Alan said? Because some Alexi, it, go ahead, it, please. Let's yeah. just roll on. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, I was thinking about what Alan was describing, that Stonewall wasn't actually that, um, frankly, that inclusive as an incipient point for the Pride riots, because I had just recently read Miss Major Speaks, which is Miss Major's new book with Toshio Moronic, which I would highly recommend if you haven't read. It came out mid-May. Um, and yeah, Miss Major speaks at length. Um, Miss Major, who is a, a, a contemporary of Allen's, who is someone who was around for Stonewall and any number of Pride and liberation events for queer and trans people over the last 50 years. Um, has said that it's hard to, you know, pinpoint these exact moments of history because we haven't all always been the best comrades. Like it, it, it's hard to look back and historicize and romanticize those moments of activism without being honest about the fact that, you know, there's tension within our movements at, at the same time. But I also think it's really helpful to generatively, not to keep using that word, but to, you know, to be historically accurate to Alan's point, I totally agree. And to think about like, how can we keep those things in mind now? And how can we do a better job of finding points of connection to keep everybody included and to move from a place where it doesn't have to just be one one select group of us or whatever and how intersectionality can be about more strategically um, holding and carrying each other through these mo moments. So I'm glad you brought that up, Alan, and I just want to shout out that book recommendation because I have been thinking a lot about Ms. Major's experiences during that decade and whatever throughout this time. Kalima, go ahead. No, I'm just co-signing on both responses. Okay, good. I thought, I thought that. <laughs> yeah, that was just me doing a co-sign on both responses. I think it's important for us. Activism is an ephemeral experience. And I think that it is hard to capture the ephemeral. And we can try to be as as, as accurate in our historical moments and in our specifics um, for particular moments, but capturing those moments are really, really hard because activism and this activist spirit is an ephemeral thing. Um, so 
I find it really important that history and understanding history and then understanding the contestations against history are conversations that we have as a movement as well, right? That we have to keep having these conversations of, well, I need to insert my understanding of this from my perspective. And I need to insert my understanding from this perspective. Because if we sit around and say that one person's narrative of a historical moment is the most accurate one, we're not we're discounting the very individual ways that we experience movements when they're in the process and when they're happening. You know what I'm saying? So I think having this conversation about accountability and con contestations of the specifics is super important. So I'm just happy that it's happening. Lexi made a reference a minute ago to the fact that the right wing is uh, using much of the same vocabulary it used in the past. And that's true. I don't know how many listeners will know the name Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant and her husband, Bob Green, launched a campaign against gay people in Florida in the 1970s. It was called Save Our Children. Right. It was an anti-gay and lesbian campaign premised on the idea that somehow we were harming children. Mm -hmm. and what is the right wing saying now? That we're grooming children, that we're pedophiles. When any uh, historian or I should say any criminal specialist will tell you that any the, the great majority of people accused of improper sexual behavior with children or white heterosexual men, very often uh, relatives of the of the child that's involved. So these lies that are coming from the right wing, they're repetition, and it includes Christianity. Anita Bryant was waving the uh, the flag of Christianity at the same time. So we need to be aware of the fact that these are old ideas that are being uh, recreated and and used again to attack us. And fortunately, we've had some fine responses. Uh, including some excellent uh, uh, television shows and movies that have shown the uh, the bad behavior of the right wing, and we need to bring that to to the attention of more people. I mean, I mean, Brian, we... these are very nasty people. They're very nasty oh, yeah. people. They're li the biggest liar of all is the man who some people can't say his name. I'm not afraid to say his name. His name, his name is Donald Trump, and he's been telling <laughs> terrible lies for so long. And, um, and uh, you know, people say 45 and they say DT and they say the orange man. They say all kinds of things. But his name is Donald Trump. It's a public record. And he's yeah. still around and he wants to be president again. That's one of the most frightening things. And we should certainly all be unified in an effort to stop that from happening. Mm. Yeah, I keep on thinking there's not a pie big enough to hit all of these people. Um, <laughs> just think about Anita Bryant moment. <laughs> there's just not a pie big enough to get all of them. But if I can find that pie, every single one I of them, see. right? <laughs> you know your I mean, there was a pie thrown at her one time. That's right. Exactly. I didn't do that. Was, that. that was a I famous moment. To lean toward... <laughs> Bam. She, she brought oranges into our living room. And, and, oh, yeah. and her juices. And her oh. juices. I, I was like not alive for literally any of this, and yet I've still seen video of it. So I just want to be clear. I've seen the pie. I've seen the I've seen the oranges. I'm 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 following the bits, you know. So oh, it's funny. Oh, can I just pull back real fast? Go ahead, now? go ahead, please, cleanly. Yes. Um with Anita Bryant and all of these things about Save Our Children, it's just the moral panics. And every five years there's a moral panic, right? Every five years, we trot out, save the children about something, right? And it's always disingenuous. It's always a disingenuous way to frame a marginalized group. And it's also extremely disempowering the children themselves, um, as if children don't have identities, right? As if they weren't born with identities and understandings of how they want to operate in the world. So I just, just needed to bring that up, but go so ahead. I, I'm curious what, what you all think about what happens at this moment. And I, I was, when I look at the power of the right wing in this country, and it really is growing, and how they have seized a lot of power in at least 26 states, as I said at the very beginning. And two things are happening simultaneously. One is the attack on black voting rights and voting rights in, in, in particular throughout this country. And along with that are the attacks against gay, lesbian, trans community and, and people in this country, in, in those states. And once again, to me, it's like these, these struggles 
both those struggles kind of born during similar periods, you know? And when I look way back in American history, in the 1860s and 70s, we saw the hope and, and, and the blooming of reconstruction, and we saw its destruction and the rise of white supremacy and of, of, of uh, this kind of white movement in America and the institution of segregation. And, I, and, we're, and, and it seems to me in some ways, both in terms of voting rights, but, but we're talking today about the rights of gay, lesbian, trans people in this country are under attack everywhere. So I, I want to I talk a bit about that. I mean, what, again, we're seeing a period where the, a movement struggled to change things from especially the late 50s through the early 70s. And now we're seeing a huge pushback. But there's a difference in that the rights of gay, lesbian, trans people in this country have become embedded also in the culture in ways that never happened before. So where do you see that, that struggle at this moment? Where is it taking us? What do you think we are facing? And, and, and I'm gonna start, let me start off, Lexi, let me start off with you. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a funny time to be doing this, the job that I do as like a <laughs> queer and trans identified person. I just got back from a couple leaves of, weeks of leave. And um, the first story that I published this week was an interview with a queer congressperson talking about how she had to, Becca Ballin of Vermont, talking about how she had to correct a congressional hearing a testimony witness about bringing up just completely false information about trans children and gender affirming care. The second story I had go up this week was about Nazis protesting outside of a drag story hour on Sunday in New Hampshire, um, where a group of 30 Nazis, literally like Nazis, like a not like, like very publicly, we are neo-Nazis, white supremacists had a big banner saying defend whiteness, basically defend white culture. Um, showed up outside a New Hampshire drag story hour that had roughly like eight attendees besides the people that were working it. Um, and so there's these huge, there, you can kind of break it into like two sections, right? You've got like the political element of this campaign in which right-wingers have very strategically decided to bankroll anti-queer and trans propaganda as basically like a campaign strategy in advance of 2024. And then you've also got, you know, what it looks like on the ground, which I would say is the more concerning aspect, because a lot of these like legislative pushes aren't winning. We saw this week that in Arkansas, their, you know, big first gender affirming care ban that would have been like the first in the country to really pass on that was deemed in unconstitutional and banned yesterday. So it's not necessarily that they're winning on the legislative front. Um, and that's something that takes a lot of time. But it is worth looking at how obviously like the streets are going to continue to be where stuff happens that really matters. Right. And so let's talk like, for example, that Sunday drag story hour that I just reported on um, at the end of the day, they just the Nazis just left. They went. Nothing happened. No one got hurt. We're all very fortunate that that's the case. And most of the time at that particular place where they host a drag story hour, it's called Teetotaler. It's a cafe. Um, they have counter protesters show up and defend the store and defend the, the workers. And we're seeing a lot of stories of that nationwide. And to something you said earlier, Mark, about um, like how LGBTQ folks are already here and being accepted in you know, hegemonic culture in certain ways, whether or not they're being protected. Um, a lot of my other stories are talking to queer and trans musicians, actors, like cultural workers who have decided to go all in this year on just being a thorn in um, politician sides. Like all sorts of people who every time they travel through on tour in Tennessee, bring drag performers out, you know? Like, I think that there's like a really vibrant moment going on right now where we're already here to what Alan said like we're not in the closet we're already out we're already present and people who have the positional priv privilege to be able to you know be touring through a state or like whatever be a cultural worker who has attention and capital in that point are going to continue to be signaling to young queer people like we're going to keep moving through this. But I think much more important to me as a as an adult and someone who's trying to be like an interlocutor through these movements is to be able to have these intergenerational conversations because this is what keeps me going and keeps me 
able to keep covering this stuff because it gets really sad and dark and depressing and uh, can feel a lot scarier when you're looking at all the stories on mass. But really, um, there's more of us than there are of them. They're just really loud and have access to power right now. So it's like it's not a lost fight by any means, in my in my opinion. So that's my spiel. I'm I'm 82 years old, so I'm definitely a, a certified uh, as an old person. <laughs> and I people 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 that I encounter from from time to time, you know, people I haven't seen for a while, say, "Oh, how are you? How are you doing?" And I find myself, uh, you know, using two words that I that I like to promote, and it sort of fits in with what other the what both Lexi and Liam are saying, which is, and those two words are gratitude and optimism. We have a lot of reasons to a lot of things to be grateful for. And I think we need I'm grateful for the fact that young people like the 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 two of you uh, on the uh, on this program with me today are doing what you're doing. I don't know all of what you're doing, uh, but it sounds pretty good to me. And I think that's really important that young people are moving forward and doing things that are creative and different and making progress. And I think some of this is what's seen on on the television screen. It upsets the the haters and the white nationalists. I've seen gay couples in an advertisement. I've seen interracial couples in an advertisement. More black faces on the television screen than were seen when I was a kid. And I think that's great progress and things to be grateful for. And I also want to be optimistic. I'm am I worried? I'm I'm worried a little bit, but I don't want to focus on the worry. I want to focus on optimism. And one of the things, or two of the things that make me optimistic, and I think this is really a response to Mark's question, what's what's happening now? I would say two things. One, being in the streets. There's been a lot of activity in the streets. The gay pride marches this year were quite big in many cities. I was in a small town in Massachusetts, which is the state where I live, a town of 20,000 people, Greenfield, Massachusetts. And the gay pride march had a, a people in it that you wouldn't have seen in pride marches in the past. There was a delegation from the local middle middle school. They were marching and they were students of, of varied identities marching in a gay pride march. There was a, several banks and other business and businesses in the communities were out there. Do they want our dollars? Of course they want our dollars, but they're also making a statement. And I think that's really important. And the other thing that's current to me is the Democratic Party. I feel we live, I, I was at different times in my past, um, either opposed to both parties or promoting a third party. I've become a Democrat. And I think the Democratic Party mm-hmm. now, I see some frowns. I see, I think the Democratic Party now has become the home for many progressive people with good ideas. And, and certainly it's the Democrats that are most likely to combat the Republicans, which has become the home for the far right. The Republicans are no longer um, people like even Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon. They're nasty right wing liars promoting misinformation and hatred in a way that uh, we never saw before. So that's why I think it's important for every young people, people of all ages to vote and preferably vote Democrat, because I think that's going to make a big difference. In, in California right now, with the retirement of Senator Feinstein, there are three very qualified people seeking the Democratic nomination out there. And uh, good luck to all three of them. I don't vote in California, so <laughs> I don't have to have a favorite. But I do think it's a good sign that there are people who want to serve the community in a positive way. And I use the word community in the broadest sense of people who want to have progress and peace and love in our world, which is what we need. Well, go ahead, Kalima. Well, I'll, I'll jump in after you finish. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I think, so where is this taking us? I wrote that down. And the the place where I feel the most fear, I think is just sort of born out of my positionality as a Black woman in academia. Um, and the way that the right is using and att- using black feminist thought and attacking critical race theory and attacking theories that um, attacking higher education in the first place. Um, I feel like that as is just as scary and just as important 
um, to fight around um, as legislation that's working, that legislation that's being pushed to uh, thwart gender affirming care for children and legislation that's pushing back on other like LGBTQ rights because many of my activists and colleagues and folks who are doing the work are academics. And the way that higher education is being attacked, the way that the liberal academy is being framed by the right, we've got to, we've, we've got a problem <laughs> that if we don't address it in the midst of doing all of the other pushback, it's just going to get worse. And there's just going to be even more of a battle to reinsert the real histories of people's experiences in this country. Because the attack against critical race theory, the attack against Black feminist thought, the horrible way that intersectionality and other things have been framed as woke, as if being awake is a bad thing. What the <laughs> hell? What the Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Yes, it is. But it's but, in this um, conversation. Yes. But... Yes. I feel like that area is extremely important as well. So it's like academia has to, the the insanity of academia is that we're often in silos and we're often just talking to one another. Um, and educational institutions are still run by white, cis, het, men with money and power and an institution that is created from that perspective will always keep oppressing and creating structural inequities for the academics who are in those streets using academia as a way to articulate what the grassroots folks are saying to be able to frame what we're going to do and what the next approach to activism should be so i think that those are the things that sort of scare me and then the things that give me a little bit of hope is the fact that academics just keep on doing that work and putting it out there. And eventually whatever you create in the academy ends up filtering out if you're coming from an interventional perspective. And I believe in interventional academics and scholarship. So I guess that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I, you know, let me throw this out because I, I've been thinking a lot about this and I don't consider myself a pessimist or an optimist in this moment. I'm not sure which way to go. I, I've, I've bounced back and forth uh, on, the, on these walls. Um, but what I do see, and, I, and a moment ago, Alan uh, raised the name of Ronald Reagan, who um, rejected a lot of Sam Jerry Falwell's anti-gay and lesbian in those days rights. But what happened then is he also moved against evolutionary theory in terms of humankind. Uh, and he started talking about the Bible having the answers to what we face. And over the last 50 years, this movement on the right has been built in part on a very fundamentalist outlook on life and on who we are as a people. Part of the heart of that is the attack uh, on, on gay, lesbian, transgender folks in this country and on, the re on that reality. And so the, the attack at the moment is on what you're allowed and not to allowed to teach in schools in many states in this country. As, and that and that is the that is open that is the, that's the opening door that is kind of kind of we'll, we'll see you're going to see that I think expand into in, into into a, a greater attack on rights in this country. So the question is, I wonder what in terms of this moment in the movement, what does that take us all? What does it take you all? What does it take you know the, 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 in our history, we talk about the Panthers and the gay rights movement in this country. That relationship was real. It was also fraught with stuff, fraught with kind of all kinds of internal problems, but it was real. But they came about at the same time in terms of fighting to really change the social, political, human fabric of this country. And there's a pushback against that. So the question is, in, in terms of, of, uh, of what we face today, in terms of the rhetoric that is, is, that is increasing this country, where do we think that pushback comes from? And where do you think that takes the struggle in the, in the, in the coming years? And, you know, and I, I, let's, I'd like to jump into that for a moment. I, I guess what I'll, what I'll say is, and I was thinking about this while Kalima was speaking earlier about the um, critical race theory, uh, the, the hyperfixation on academic terminology that isn't actually taught in the way that it's, um, like, it's not actually in K-12 schools or American public education in the way that it actually is taught in the academy. Um, you know, I think the thing that I wanted to highlight 
that Kalima also said before is that this is all about wanting to turn children into political objects as opposed to young people who actually have political agency, which we know through looking at histories forever has always been the case. Just looking at Alan, Alan was originally a young person when Alan was doing his organizing. <laughs> so case in point, it's always been, they've always been involved in these movements. Young folk have always had political agency. And if you look at the organizing that's happening in Florida, for example, um, under Ron DeSantis, um, you know, the same folks who are showing up with the Dream Defenders to fight the book bans and the restrictions around, you know, the AP on at, at removing African American history are the same people who are still showing up when it comes to going to the state house to fight over gender affirming care bar- bans. So the young people that I'm talking to who are doing organizing in these states very clearly understand the connections between the ideological attacks on education and how they are broadly about making it harder to in my opinion, like understand oneself, like they want to fight self-knowledge so that people can't grow into their true selves. They want to make it harder and harder again for us to leave the closet, whether that's understanding black liberation or that's understanding queer liberation. And so I think the thing that I'm seeing is that unfortunately, um, you know, when I was an org- organizer, we used to say like, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Like we can't like, you can't unhide, you can't just go make it so that these young people don't know their history because the the internet exists. It's too late. There's not like a a possible way for us to um, unroll all of this. And so although I'm sure that the antagonism and the vitriol is not going to get any lighter necessarily, I think the thing that I'm watching and will continue to watch is young people who are finding these connections just really organically. Like once, once they see them, it's very like, light on like oh right like of course these struggles are intertwined of course these this is our work is to show up and fight on these issues and i think that the more that that's happening the more sustainable the movement is you know when i'm thinking about it as you were speaking and what we've been talking about here is let me just take one prime example here that if you look at what's happening in florida if you look at what desantis is doing in florida if you, his whole don't say gay laws that, that, that are taking place, that, that's what people are labeling them, um, that, that barring trans people from public facilities, not allowing to talk about gender identity in classrooms and schools. And that is just kind of the root of the beginning. Um, there's a, a new measure that said gender identity instruction in, in kindergarten, all through 11th grade, is, is not allowed in public schools. This to me is w- the beginning of an, of an all out assault. This is where it starts. Because you start talking about children, you start talking about uh, not allowing uh, gay fam- gay and lesbian families to, to, to marry, to raise children, that this is the beginning of a serious assault. We're just seeing the root of it, I think, at this moment. So the question is, you know, we, the, the, that, which is why I can say, why I said earlier, I'm neither a pessimist nor an optimist, because I just see what's happening before me, but see the real dangers lying ahead. You know, given given the power in certain states in this country, uh, the divide is taking place. So how do we respond to that after all the struggles that have taken place in the last 50 years? Kalima, go ahead. I don't know. What crosses my brain when I think about this is uh, spectacle culture. <laughs> spectacle culture? Um, uh-huh. Spectacle culture, right? So we're all media uh, consumers, media makers, um, and that... The discourse now, I think one of the dangerous, so we've been saying off and on throughout this conversation that this struggle has been ongoing and we always got to fight, right? Right. The key thing that is different is the way discourse happens or is allowed to happen. When you have five corporations that own all of the media outlets and you have media broadcasting groups like the Sinclair Media Broadcasting Group buying up newspapers, literally putting legislation on the – they literally got legislation passed this year in Maryland, right? When you have – these spaces where are the spaces where we're able to have discourse have been so corrupted, so diffused. It makes it really hard to understand that there's a fight that is going on that pushes back against all of it, right? So then you feel 
it contributes to a feeling of pessimism because you don't see all the activism and the work that's happening. It contributes to a feeling of this this fight, you're just going to lose it because you don't see how people are responding and how they're sharing information. It also means that we have a lot of folks who are consuming content, but the attack on education is about teaching people or about taking away people's ability to be discerning. When you add deep fakes, when you add AI, when you add all of these other ways, we're being inundated with media, but there's not enough of uh, outlets so that people see and understand different perspectives. And we're not teaching young people how to question and how to read and how to have discourse and how to debate. And when social media is only being used as an instrument for impression management and actually not discourse, and impression management is being seen as activism when it isn't, this is where the danger lies. So I think we've always been pushing back and pushing back and pushing back. The issue is we've got an awful lot of media, an awful lot of consumption, and not an awful lot of ways to be discerning or understanding of how we wrest that power back. And that's drowning out the fight. Big, big snaps for everything Kalima just said. And it's like stuff I think about for my job all the time. And I just like to say Teen Vogue is trying really, 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 really hard to help people be more discerning. And now no, y'all be been in these streets. Teen yeah. Vogue been in these streets for like the last 10 years. Like y'all been in these streets. I've been digging it. And I'd like to give our other two guests just a chance to, uh, very briefly to finish up with your closing thoughts about where we are and where we go in the next couple of minutes. Well, certainly it seems to me that one of the, um, one of the goals of uh, DeSantis and people like him, is to crush information and promote more disinformation. And But there are so many efforts in the other direction, and I think those efforts are bound to continue. Just a small example, I was visiting friends in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale last year, and I went to the uh, City History Museum, and there was an, a, a marvelous display there all about the Native American indigenous people that inhabited Florida. And I have some knowledge. I'm a well-educated guy. But yeah, you say Florida Indians. I say, oh, yeah, the Seminoles. Well, there were seven very large groups of Native peoples in Florida before the white people came. They were all over the state. They weren't just living in the Everglades and the swamps. They were everywhere. And this history museum in the city of Fort Lauderdale promoted and supported by the city, and a friend of mine was doing teaching there as a volunteer, they're getting the message out. And so the idea that, you know, to take it out of the schools, I, I think there's gonna be too many educators who know that Amer the American people need to know that this, this land that we call our land was lived in by indigenous people before we got here. And we killed many of them, so many that if I think about it a lot, it'll make me weep. And we know that there are native, uh, there are indigenous people now who have tribal councils and, and we they look for allies in the political system. And a woman with a Native American uh, ancestry was brought into the cabinet by President Biden. And I think we need to look at the, those positive things that are going on as well as a lot of the troublesome things that that uh, Dr. Dr. Young was talking about. And I just want to say one more thing since you, you meant, I mentioned, I threw the name of Ronald Reagan. I absolutely agree with you, Mark, that Reagan in many ways is responsible for bringing uh, right-wing Christian ideas into government. And that's something I'm not, by mentioning Ronald Reagan, I wasn't saying, oh, he, oh he's a good guy. I was just saying, I know, yeah. and it sounds crazy that somehow, he was less horrible or less crazy than than some of the characters that we're seeing now. I think that the level of misinformation and just pure hatred that we're seeing now is something new and, and more frightening and that we need to be very concerned about. So in that sense, I think a difference between the current right wingers and those uh, of past decades. But, you know, there were plenty of Nazis and the Nazi sympathizers in the U.S. Congress even in the 1940s. And if you haven't heard it, Rachel Maddow has done a wonderful uh, podcast called Rachel Maddow Ultra, in which she uh, informs us about the, uh, the, the power of the Nazis in the U.S. 
in the late 1930s and even into the war years. Journalists like Rachel Maddow are a great alternative to the misinformation. Lexi, take us home as we close out. Yeah, no, sorry, I can. Um, Yeah, I guess um, while Alan was speaking, I was also thinking about how um, indigenous communities have been aware of transness much longer than Western society. And that's also a thing strategically being taken out of education. Like it's not not to be like, Ooh, it's all connected, but it, of course it is all, all connected. And it's so funny to me how that, you know, by once again, by suppressing all of us, they suppress all of us. So, and like all we can keep doing is being the, dandelions and the cracks in the pavement right like over and over and over again um and so yeah i think i to 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 kalima's point i i think that's absolutely true they want us to feel scared and frankly a lot of the queer and trans people i know in my personal life let alone you know the folks i report to day in and day out day out are 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 scared like i i over the weekend, just donated money to a friend of a friend who's currently leaving Florida because she lost her gender affirmation. She asked, she lost access to hormones. So she's currently in Mm. the process of moving from the state. She's a college student. She's transferring colleges. She is moving hundreds of miles away so that she can continue living life just as she had been. And, and this is a 20 year old. So I want to, and I want to be like abundantly, abundantly clear when they are doing these things, picture a kid. And remember that that's who it's happening to any any kid, um, and they don't care. They they these people don't care. And so like we have the privilege of having ethics, having values, having you know, like love for one another. And that's not at all what's on the on, on the menu with these fascists and uh, extremists. And so I think what's making whether it's nihilism positivity whatever like i I think the 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 reality of the situation is we've got a lot more going on and like we've got a much longer history of winning and finding ever more new ways to do it that makes all of the um what was the word that you used before kalima um the crisis no 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 no, the thing that they're doing like we're in like a a moment of coverage that's like spectacle yeah, spectacle. Exactly. Yes. Which is why uh shouts out Sophia Noble. Lots to say about like the media spectacle stuff. But um mm, yeah, yes. just like gotta keep it moving. Like the spectacle's gonna keep going and we're gonna continue having responses as that's going. But at the same time, we've been here, we'll be here, and that's all there is to it. Well, thank you three. This has been great. And it's a great way to conclude it. Lex uh Leslie McMenamin and Alan Young and Khalid Young, thank you all so much for taking time today and uh we'll keep on struggling. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Peace, y'all. Thank you, Mark. Keep on keeping on, as they say. <laughs> Will do. And thank you all for joining us today on the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. It's been great to have you all with us. I want to thank our guests one more time, Lexi McMenamin, Alan Young, and Kalima Young. And so please write to me here at mss at therealnews.com. I want to hear your thoughts and ideas what we should be covering next, the stories that you have from your communities, and what you thought about today's program. We're in this together, and I'm here to highlight what's happening in your communities as well. So let's stand together. For Kelly Rivera and David Hebden and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Take care, stay involved, keep listening, and please stay in touch. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work, so please, Tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.